Okay, we'll get started. I want to uh, welcome everybody back who's been here again, who was here before in our previous uh, demonstrations, and invite uh, and welcome all the uh, newcomers, and hope to have you back again. The uh, this is the second year anniversary of the first time we did a demonstration showing the phenomena where we ignited water and made an enormous amount of power, predominantly in the form of uh, light. And in the intervening time, we demonstrated a number of um, manifestations of how to commercialize that, different uh, engineering designs and prototypes. And that culminated in a uh, device that we showed in uh, July 21st, uh, 2014, with about 18 months ago. Since then, we've been very busy and we did a lot of work. I'm going to go through some of the, um, the uh, trials and travails, the trajectory and different paths we took. Some led to uh, other innovations, some led to other ideas, some were totally a waste of time. That's the way it is in science and engineering. But in, you uh, pick up the pieces, you learn from your mistakes or learn from designs that weren't optimal. Our goal is to commercialize, to have something that can replace fire, that uh, will be lasting, and that is, is, can dominate in the energy industry. And I think we have that. I think we have a design that can prevail above all other forms of systems, all other forms of energy and power. And uh, it, I believe it is the only, the only solution to climate change. Whether you believe it or not, uh, it will not produce any CO2. It will not produce any pollution of any form. And it, it appears that it can work for all forms of power, for stationary and motive, all forms of motive, and, uh, and, it, and it has uh, economic characteristics, can do that without, without the necessity of support from the government. It should be totally driven by its economics. So I um, want to introduce very quickly the uh, kind of the agenda we have and the people that are uh, running the program today. We have two teams that are setting up sun cells. They'll be running demonstrations. We have um, Daniel Rodriguez and Paul Allison that are um, behind us, behind the screen. And we put that up so we wouldn't have any issues with bright lights and the like. And uh, they're going to be running their cell, uh, a sun cell. And when they, they have it up and running, they're going to cut in and uh, and show it on the uh, TV screen here. So you don't have to wear glasses or anything like that because it can get quite extraordinarily bright. And uh, typically when they're in there running it, they have to wear double shielded uh, welder's glasses. So we didn't have that for everybody. So we're going to show it on the monitor. In addition, we have another team in the other lab. And that's uh, John Latosky, Brian Ronan, and uh, Rich Fraser. They're back there getting ready, and they're going to set up their, sun, their uh, sun cell to run as well. So the, um, OK, with that, um, I'm going to go into the presentation. I'm going to go uh, through a PowerPoint. And uh, we'll cut in when they have their uh, cell running. And I'll, I'll discuss that, and then go back to the, uh, the presentation. We'll take a Q&A at the end. So we have a, uh, a sun cell we think appropriately named. And uh, it's probably a familiar slide, the, some of the energy markets. I think the, uh, the important thing is the um, amount that energy resources are worth, eight billion, or $8 trillion. You can't even talk in billions in this category. And, uh, and the infrastructure cost of a trillion annually and then, of course, there's a lot of talk about wind and solar and like, but it's projected to only meet 15% of demand even in 2040. It, it really, the energy sources that are being developed today really don't have the capability or capacity to solve long-term energy uh, needs. So uh, we have a new energy source. It's based on uh, producing a new form of, of uh, atomic hydrogen that reacts to form a new form of molecular hydrogen we call hydrino. I'll describe a little further. It's the dark matter of the universe. 
So you have um, burning hydrogen, you form water. We're actually using water as the fuel source and using the hydrogen atoms to make this more stable, inert, uh, non-reactive, dark matter form of hydrogen. And that releases enormous amount of energy compared to burning. Uh, minimally, if you wanted to compare it on a volumetric uh, basis, um, 100, 100 gallons of gasoline would be required to replace one gallon of water. And that's at a very, very conservative basis. So, um, so it's clean and non-polluting. It's commercially competitive. And uh, we have some licenses on a, on a former designs we have using central generation. Central generation is, is, uh, has been viable for 100 years, but the problem with it is it, it's very big, it's very expensive, uh, it requires a grid. You do a field trial would be many, many years, and then you'd start building out more and more plants. So it's a, it would take a while to, to, uh, to undergo a transition to this energy source using central gen as a primary uh, path. So what we've done is we've invented, created an energy source that's completely autonomous to the grid and fuels infrastructure. It can be mass reduced like car engines. In that case, it should proliferate very, very quickly. So the cost is uh, very competitive, as I was saying. Uh, we think we can generate for under a fraction of a cent per kilowatt hour for uh, electricity. And this compares very favorably to other forms of energy uh, sources. Again, it uh, also has the advantage of its 24-7, 365. So it doesn't stop when the sun goes down or the wind stops blowing. The, uh, the, the foundation of the technology is uh, applying physical laws, which are the pillars of a modern, uh, modern society. Basically, it's the classical laws, like force equals time derivative momentum, or if you like, F equals MA, uh, the electrodynamic equations of Maxwell, things that you can prove, things that are taught in every university in the whole entire world that did gave us the modern technologies we have today. As you know, back in the, or you might not be aware of, back in the early part of the 20th century, physicists were perplexed at what the structure of the atom was. And uh, the, suffice it to say, in synopsis, physicists never solved the structure of the electron. They, they, they treat it purely mathematically even today. No one can tell you what an electron looks like. In fact, they say the electron can never be identified. You can, it doesn't even exist as a, as a discrete structure. It's, or having a discrete energy. It's everywhere at once simultaneously, has no physical form. You can't pin it down. You can't describe what it is. It can't, it can't exist in anything that's describable. Only in terms of uncertainties and probabilities and the like. That's not true. The electron's a real physical entity. It has charge, it has mass, it's very definable, it has very discrete, precise energy levels. And if you apply those physical laws correctly, you can solve exactly what electron is. So this is uh, a computer rendering of how the current is distributed in space and time that makes up the, uh, the electron. So these, these little arrows are telling you how the electron moves and how the current flows. And it gives you properties, the electron, and there's fancy names like lamb shift, uh, fine structure, hyperfine structure, G factor, lifetime of states, uh, on and on. And, it, and it, the physical laws solve those problems exactly. One of the things you'll see in physics books, you take physics, and you learn all this elegant physics, and they say, forget all that. Now we have this stuff at the atomic level that's pure math. And then you're thinking, well, why doesn't that work at the level of the atom? Because everything else is made out of atoms, and they, they use the physical law. So why can't the atoms be the physical law? Because the, the, things, the things that compri are comprised the atoms obey them. And it turns out they do. It's just it was never solved correctly. And when you do apply those laws, it's an incredibly precise and predictive over 85 orders of magnitude of scale. 
and you can solve very complicated things that you cannot solve today. For example, molecules and analytical expression. This is DNA and insulin, for example. The, this approach solves every single electron, the atomic and molecular, and their charge distribution, and every property, how it moves, how fast it's moving, what its energy is, what its magnetic energy is, electric energy, kinetic energy, that is the energy of motion. All those parameters are precisely known for every single point uh, position on these molecules. And it's very powerful. We have about 4,000 people using this software now. It takes analytical solutions of molecules and applies it to unknowns of boundless extent and complexity, and it gets it absolutely identical. So here's a paper we published to verify that precise for precise cases. There's 415 molecules. Here's there's, uh, the predicted and experimental. It's a part per 100,000 agreement. This is uh, using an advanced program. They don't, they can't, you can't even describe what electron is in current, uh, in the current paradigm. But you can, you can take numbers and crunch big numbers. They call them basis sets or semi-empirical data sets where they're basically trying to interpolate a curve to something else. And you can see, you can say quantum does an incredibly great job but then it ignores all the other cases, it does a very horribly bad job. The other thing is quantum says you cannot, this quantum mechanical theory, not quantum energy levels, quantum mechanical theory that says H psi equals E psi, the electron has no physical form, it's everywhere at once, has an infinite number of energies and positions. Simultaneously, that theory, not the quantum experimental energy levels, which this predicts precisely, you can, it says you can't image molecules. Well, there's an image of a molecule. And there's a lot of these examples you'll find in the literature and, inter, and on the internet. It's atomic force microscopy. And here you can see hydrogen atoms. You can see carbon, carbon, carbon uh, bonds. This is the analytical, physical uh, uh, solution. And it lay, overlays identically. It gets all the bond angles, bond distances, and all the pr parameters precisely. So a picture is worth a thousand words. This picture alone disproves quantum and confirms classical theory. So theory is really great for explaining things, but it's even better when it predicts things because we use classical laws to engineer new things like energy cells and trains and planes and waveguides and power transmission systems and things like that. That's what you use theory for. We don't even think of classical laws as theory anymore. We think of it as engineering. But in the days when they were discovered, they were quite, quite uh, remarkable in terms of uh, intellectual circles, in terms of elucidating the fundamental aspects of matter and energy. Well, here's a, here's a classical law, laws applied to predicting a new energy process. You have the blue guy here, which is a hydrogen atom. And you have an energy acceptor. Now, ordinarily, the hydrogen atom can't go down to a lower energy state. It can't release energy by emitting light. Well, we all know hydrogen can react. It can react to form water quite violently. So the electrons can go closer to the protons. That's how you get energy. The negative and positive get closer. But then the question is, why doesn't the electron itself get closer to the proton on its own without reacting with something else? And it turns out it can for the specific case of the hydrogen atom. In particular, the negative charge electron, this blue soap bubble, can get closer to that center uh, proton by transferring energy radiationlessly to this yellow guy. And the amount of energy that, that is transferred in that particular reaction is very high. It's higher than the ionization energy of any known atom. Like helium is uh, 24.59, the energy transfer is an integer of 27.2. So this reaction, the energy accepting reaction, has to result in ions and electrons. So there's an energy transfer. You create an intermediate state, a metastable state, and then the electron is going to be attracted. Because of that energy transfer, it's going to be attracted more tenaciously, greater strength of attraction, and it's going to drop 
to a smaller radius and release additional energy. That is different than an excited state relaxing. Electrons can absorb energy, light, and go to a higher energy level, and then drop out back and give the light. This is a different process. And because of that, it's irreversible, and because of the way the energy is released in the second step, you end up with continuum radiation that has a cutoff, the highest energy of that radiation is the difference between that metastable intermediate and the final stable hydrogen atom. So it turns out, I want to show you this. This is the reaction of atomic hydrogen to a lower energy state. And that is enormously powerful kinetics. So what we wrestled with, or we dealt with for many, many years is getting the reaction rate up fast because you get a lot of energy from this, but it's a very, very slow reaction. And then the question was, why is it a slow reaction? And the reason is, is because the nature of the mechanism, you're transferring energy to an acceptor and it's ionizing. And we all know if you walk across the rug on a, on a dry day like today when the, when the heat's on, you get charged up and you get electrically shocked. Well, you don't get charged up forever, or you'd, your arm would burn off. I mean, there's so much current going through it. Luckily, your energy level gets higher the more you get charged up, so you don't get charged up to infinity, like a Van de Graaff generator, and let off a lightning bolt, kill your wife or something. <laughs> so the, um, it turns out it's limiting. But that energy level change stops the chemical reaction that we're talking about. So it's self-limiting. So what we're applying now is a condition where there's two ways you can do it. A uh, condition where you alleviate that charge. One is you make an arc current. An arc current actually lowers the energy the higher the current. Typically the energy gets higher the higher the current, but this is actually the opposite case. It's a different state of matter. It's like lightning. The more current, the lower the voltage, the lower the energy of the system, and it, and it self-reinforces itself. It's like positive feedback. The other way is you can, uh, you can make a highly conductive matrix where the electrons are absorbed on highly conductive metal particles or they're conducted away in such a fashion. And when you do that, as I was showing, you get explosive kinetics. Explosive. I mean, like incredibly off the chart power density. Thousands of millions times more than internal combustion engine. If you look at what the power is and how small that volume is, enormous power density. So then the trick is, and this is what we were showing back two years ago, that flash of light is essentially the entire amount of power being released from that reaction. There's very little pressure volume work, or at least we could design it so there's little pressure volume work. Pressure volume work is like an internal combustion engine where you fire a, a spark into gasoline and it builds up gas pressure and it pushes a piston and it does mechanical work. In this case, we can take light and the idea is to convert that light into electricity using photovoltaic cells, which is about a trillion dollars spent developing. So it's very convenient. There's two problems with this. Well, there's more than two, but there's two main problems. One is you have to fire and sustain that reaction at a thousand times per second. And this reaction is triggered by an arc current, which is a lot of current. So you, it's, it's hard to switch a lot of current very fast. Then you have to inject at a thousand times a second. You have to recirculate. You have to regenerate the fuel at a thousand times a second. All very, very challenging engineering uh, obstacles. So um, the other problem is, as I'll show you, the light you're seeing is only a very small fraction of the light. Almost all the light is in what they call the soft X-ray extreme ultraviolet, vacuum ultraviolet region. And photovoltaic cells don't respond to that. It's too high in energy. It's like your eye can't even see it. 
So your eye is sort of similar to a photovoltaic cell in terms of the region of the electromagnetic spectrum or the frequencies of light to which it is responsive. So we have a way of addressing both of those problems. So as I was saying, as the hydrogen atom goes down to a lower energy level, you get continuum soft X-ray light. So this is a uh, arc plasma discharge. And uh, as I was saying, between the intermediate and the final energy state, the highest energy is 122.4 electron volts. That's about 100 times typical chemical reactions. And the, uh, you can see it's all wavelengths. Compared to these lines, these oxygen ion lines, this is all wavelengths. It's a continuum band. It's very different. That radiation is also seen from coming from all over the sky, from space, from everywhere. And no one really knows the origin, and it's an enormous amount of, of energy. We're seeing ultraviolet and extreme ultraviolet of precisely that form from all over the sky. And another enigma, this black or dark ring, non-light emitting ring, is, a, is identified as dark matter. And you can identify it as dark matter because it has enormous gravitational effect, but there's no light being emitted. And you can tell that because you have uh, galaxies here that are somewhat oblique, and if you move the telescope, they will disappear. So they're being gravitationally lensed from other regions of the universe. So you have gravity, but no absorption or emission of light. That's dark matter. This other emitting material and absorbing material is ordinary hydrogen. Stars are made out of ordinary hydrogen. Essentially everything in the universe is ordinary hydrogen. But that's only about 1% of the mass that's out there. The rest is hydrogen in a more chemically stable state. It's hydrino form of hydrogen. So what we're doing is we're taking hydrogen, making dark matter form of hydrogen. It's emitting very high energy, ultraviolet, and extreme ultraviolet light, and that's what you're seeing coming from all over, the, all over space. It's the same light. It also ionizes the gases around the sun. So the sun looks like it's 2 million degrees, and it's really not. You have, high, you have carbon monoxide molecules in the gases around the sun. It's not 2 million degrees. It is not being ionized by thermal effects, it's being ionized by the soft x-ray light emitted by this process. In fact, our cell looks like the surface of the sun when you play it in slow motion. It has the same temperature as the sun. It's the same phenomena occurring. And the surface of the sun is, is, is the temperature of our cell. It's around 5,000 to 6,000 degrees Kelvin. And the sun, gases around it get ionized the same way gases in our cell get ionized. You can get highly ionized ions because the high energy light that's being produced. And that's a good thing because you can take the high energy light and you can convert it into visible wavelengths that you can convert with conventional concentrator photovoltaic cells. So there's a lot of analytical tests we've done to, uh, these are what chemists know, there's uh, different uh, instruments that identify uh, signatures of molecules and atoms, and we've done about uh, more than 12 different analytical tests. This is one of them. Here's a new peak here that occurs after we run the cell. This is a rotational energy of the uh, molecular Hydrino, it's called H214. The particular catalyst we're using uh, creates this molecule as a final product. More examples of that. And then the molecule can vibrate and it can rotate and you can get transitions between those different energy levels. These are the calculated and experimental in this table. Calculated, experimental, relative difference. And you can see here that this is absolutely reproducible. We've done this at multiple labs, including the instrument manufacturer. Um, there's nothing known to man that matches that spectrum. It's an extraordinarily high energy region. 
there's, there's no other material in the universe that makes that spectrum. There's nothing you can, you can confuse it with. And all the peaks match identically. The other thing we can do is we can do X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy. We get a new peak here. This has been done at multiple leading universities, state-of-the-art instruments, or computer, computers cannot assign this peak. It's a new peak. It's identified after we run our reaction, and it matches identically the total binding energy, the new molecule that we're forming. And that was predicted, experiment, or predicted and it matches identically the experimental observations. So there's multiple examples of this, how we can take the characteristics for this new molecule and prove by analytical instrumentation that that's what we're making in the cell. So we saw the individual blast. It lasts about a thousandth of a second. If we can fire those at a thousand times a second, we would have continuous radiation. Now, obviously, we didn't have the mechanism or the engineering to do that, but to prove the principle, we would fire them on a mechanical belt. We basically put them on a, a mechanical system, fired them, and then converted that light into electricity, then converted the electricity into a diode emitting uh, light. So there's the blast. And the idea is to take that blast and convert it into electricity using photovoltaic cells which everybody's familiar with. And then here's the application. So pretty straightforward. That's where we were about 18 months ago. We advanced it a little further. We increased the rate, increased to make a system where it had the potential recirculating. And I'll go through what those different approaches were. So one of them was uh, back in July 21st, we're running this thing called a slurry pump. And we had in here a titanium water mixture. And we had a roller electrodes that were energized with a high current, 10,000 amps. Every time the slurry went through it, it would put a pulse of 10,000 amps through. And, it, and here it's converting the electricity with the PV panel into, uh, or excuse me, the light into electricity and, 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 uh, and then lighting up a diode. It looked very promising. The only point was that, that titanium reacts with water and it reacts with oxygen. So we would run it under argon, takes care of the second problem, react with water, a little bit more difficult. The kinetics for that reaction on a millisecond, you don't get much water reaction with the titanium. But over time, you do form oxides of titanium. So the idea was to run a hydrogen atmosphere, hydrogen plasma is known to reduce titanium to TiO, the single oxide form. And that's as conductive as titanium metal, fortuitously. It's very unique in that regard. The problem was the reaction wouldn't work with TiO. So we had to innovate new fuels and new techniques. So on to the next one. So the next one was we did a hydrated solid fuel powder and we used pneumatic injection. And we fed that with counter-rotating auger. So then there, the pitch is mirror images of each other. So it pushes the powder into the middle. And then there's pneumatic injectors. There's a line coming down here. And you can see here's the auger. Here's the roller electrodes. Here's another line. These two lines, blue air down into the uh, bottom of this trough. And then the powder would blow up between, uh, pneumatically get injected between those roller electrodes. So here's another close up. Here's the auger. Here you can see the. Uh, the helix. And uh, oh, let me uh, go back one more. All right, so one more. So th these are the two uh, gas lines that are blowing into this uh, powder fuel. 
and the auger is pushing it up into a mound and you can see particles here that are being blown up pneumatically and then this here this is it running running pneumatic motors because uh, because the inherent variation in the fuel feed caused the computer driven servo motors to, to uh, go out of synchrony. So these were sort of fail safe motors for this particular device. You can see it wasn't that bright. There's 10,000 amps going into it, uh, not a lot of light. Then the idea was to uh, capture the powder with a uh, cyclone separator and a pneumatic uh, air flow system. And this is a cyclone separator here, so we go back into there, and then the uh, fuel would be recovered, get rehydrated, go back in the auger, and we'd have a closed loop. And the problem is it wasn't, it just did not ignite very, very powerfully. So the next thing we tried is uh, this I thought was a very clever idea. This is a uh, silver being dripped into water. And if you're going to if you're going to get a thousand blasts per second, you have to make a thousand fuel loads per second. So you need to make a thousand fuel samples per second. This has got the capability of making a thousand fuel shots per second. So you get back to that idea with the original belt that we had. Uh, this original belt, right? you go back to this idea and you say, well, we were, getting, we were getting really, really great power out of this. So if you could make a thousand shots a second, then uh, you could run that type of system, which we know makes incredibly amounts of power. So this system actually does that. You could have multiple drippers and easily make a thousand fuel pellets. The other thing is, not many people probably know this, but water actually dissolves into the molten silk. And it's almost perfect in the time frame and the temperature we run it to load it up with the right amount of water for this reaction to work. So it automatically re regenerates itself it's extraordinarily conductive and water does not react with silver. It doesn't even react with oxygen at the temperature we're running it. So it's absolutely perfect for a fuel. No chemical reactivity at all. Ex the most conductive element and very, very easy to make shots for injecting into the system at a thousand per second. Sounds great. So we have an auger feed here. We have a pneumatic injector, and here's our roller electrodes. One problem. Look at the surface of the roller electrodes. I mean, this is minor. It would blow enormously big holes in the roller electrodes. So here's the pneumatic shooter coming up here. So two issues. I'll show you in a second. This is where we went to a slip ring. So we had to have the electrical contact with this rotating shaft. So we came up with a really good solution for that. We solved our powering uh, problems with the variation in the torque when we shot these uh, by putting these belts on and these tighteners. Uh, the torque would vary and then motors would go out of synchronization. Many, many problems. We, and we put this on, uh, on springs so the, uh, it would take some of the impact. Very, very elegant engineering, works really great. Um, two issues. Then you have to get, we found that rather than using 10,000 amps, we could use pulses with much lower current. That would make it more efficient and uh, cause less damage to electrodes. Many benefits from that. So we had an engineering firm, very, very well renowned, capable engineering firm designed a ignition source that would fire high current at very high frequency and control it with uh, programmable uh, logic controllers and software and the like. And then we had pneumatic injection and ta-da, it works. <clears throat> the only problem is this is only about two or three times per second. It's not a thousand times per second. 
it's very, very difficult to pneumatically, mechanically inject those shots. We looked at all kinds of ways of doing that, but it's very challenging, and the electrodes ended up getting extremely damaged. So, so then there was another, and then the other issue is, you can see, this is really big. This is a guy standing here, an engineer. And see, here he is here. This is a real big. So we wanted to go for cars. So that looks a little too big to put into a car. And why would you want to go for cars? Well, cars, there's 60 million cars made a year. And each one of those cars would be about 300,000 watts. So that's like 20 trillion watts. So if you get into car production, there's enough car, produ car production in terms of electrical replacement capacity to replace the grid in about 10 days. So that is very important to have capacity. That drives the cost down. It gives you all the suppliers and supply chain and all the parts. And it's just, it's the way to go. And if you want, if you really want to do this thing economically and proliferate it very quickly. Because cars can be used for other things. Right now, a car engine only lasts about 2,000 hours, and it's burning gasoline and making pollution, and it's really not set up to make electricity. But if you had something that made hundreds of thousands of electricity, you could plug it into this building, for example. You could call up Uber Electric rather than Uber Car, and they would come over and on the spot give you a lot of electricity. That's very powerful because you get several thousand cars, you can power up a whole city like in a parking garage. You don't need to have transmission lines, central power plants, fuel infrastructure, pollution, and the like. And a car can make hundreds of thousands of dollars in revenue. So you look at your car payment, you're saying, hmm, okay, I owe 250, but I'm getting, I'm getting like ten thousand dollars a month here or more selling electricity. That's pretty good. Okay, so this is the energy balance, and to give you an idea of how powerful this is for uh, motive, a liter of water will take you well over a thousand miles, and you can pull that out of the atmosphere. So there's no problem running out of electricity in an electric vehicle, and you, like I was saying, this is incredibly more powerful than the internal combustion engine. You can have extreme power. So you don't have to sacrifice power or range to have a non-polluting electric vehicle and you can make money off of it. So it seemed like the thing to do. So we went to, I, a, I think, a very elegant, there's a lot of engineering, there's a lot of material science in this and uh, this is something that that I think is really really sophisticated and it works really great. So the big power supply was replaced with supercapacitors. The injector is a electromagnetic pump. Electromagnetic pump is injecting molten silver. It has no moving parts. And they're out in the field 60 years maintenance free. And all this stuff is super cheap. In fact, all this stuff is insignificant compared to the photovoltaic converter part. And in mass production, we get the number of suns <clears throat> up around 2,000 or so. You're looking at on the order of $50 a kilowatt. I mean, this could be very, very cheap, this system. So you got a supercapacitor ignition system, bus bars carrying the, the current in. You got tungsten electrodes that don't melt till they won't melt till 3,500 degrees centigrade, and they're extremely, extremely hard, and they're igniting molten silver, which covers them, and they don't get destroyed. And there's cooling we put on this to take away the heat. I don't have all those details in here. Started up, there's an inductively coupled heater. This red is the antenna. This is the power source. This could be super cheap. This is all DC electronics. There's DC current, you can run off the PV conver uh, converter up here, and you put current into this bus bars, and they run current across these tabs through this pipe, 
which has the molten metal in it and there's magnetic fields from a magnetic circuit on either side of this which I'll show the detail and that combination of magnetic field and the electric current being run through this pipe with the molten silver pumps the silver up through the nozzle into the electrodes you get the ignition and the light fills this chamber and that's basically it there's some chillers and uh, which I'll show we got a more simplified version we just use a car radiator showing some more details this is a magnetic circuit there's magnets come in here and here current goes through here magnetic fields here and we get a force that pumps the metal up you can see it coming here and then up through the electrodes when the molten metal goes between the electrodes that's the switch to switch it on for the capacitors, the super capacitors to discharge the current into the silver and it ignites the fuel. So you don't need a big switch. And we typically fire this up to 2,000 times. It's capable based on the response time of the capacitor circuit of 10,000 times per second. We additionally have uh, gases, or we have water and hydrogen feed. We can put one or both in there. You need water for sure. You could add hydrogen optionally. So this is showing some of the cooling, where we're cooling the, uh, the magnets for the electromagnetic pump. This antenna also is, uh, is a hollow copper coil that goes to, a, to a, a water pump and then rejects heat into this uh, radiator. So once we get this going, we have to remove heat from the reservoir that injects the, uh, the metal. So that serves a dual purpose. These are the caps. The electrodes have cooling on them as well. And this is a cooling system for the uh, PV photovoltaic converter. <coughs> Showing more detail of that. <coughs> So this is more uh, detail of the uh, magnetic circuit. There's cooling systems inside here. This is a cooling coil, and then this is the uh, inlet and outlet for that. There's a magnet in here. It's a permanent magnet, so there's no, no electrification there. This is a yoke, like a, a material like high-purity iron that can go to very, very high temperatures relative to the magnet without losing its magnetization. So this conducts the magnetic field through this yoke and then into the uh, pump tube. So this is the uh, <coughs> the pump tube. The magnet uh, is here on the z-axis. The current is coming here say on the y-axis or in the transverse plane. So current comes in on these bus bars, runs through this pump tube that has molten silver in it, the magnetic field here is perpendicular and then perpendicular, perpendicular to both the current and the magnetic field you get a force it's called Lorentz force that pumps and moves the, uh, the silver uh, through the pipe and then this is the cooling system for the magnets and this is the yoke and this is the permanent magnets down here so this is what it looks like when it's heated up uh, here we're using an inductively coupled heater to heat some uh, silver and we're pumping it to test the pump. And this is what it looks like when it's hooked up to a sun cell. We have the inductively coupled heater. These are the uh, water cooling for that. We have water cooling down here for the magnets in the pump. So there's a reservoir here that has the silver in it and goes down in this pump and it's injected up into this chamber up top where the, uh, where the plasma is created and the, and the light's emitted. <clears throat> so what they're doing for the demo is uh, we would normally use, the, in, in a commercial setup, we would use the photovoltaic output, that is electricity from the photovoltaic converter, to run the inductively coupled heater to start it up, and to run the electromagnetic pump and the ignition system. What we're using now is we're, because we don't have that hooked up, is we're using a, a Matsuseda uh, 1200 amp 10 volt power supply for both. 
So it's a very, very low voltage uh, system. So this is the glove box where these guys are working. And they have a uh, sun cell in there that they're melting the silver and starting up the pump and, the, uh, and getting ready for the uh, ignition. So this is what an electromagnetic pump looks like. So you can see you vary the current. This is electrodes. There's no electricity on the bus bars or the electrodes. These are tungsten electrodes. And uh, you turn on the, uh, the current, the electromagnetic pump with the permanent magnets, and voila. You get beads of uh, silver. Uh, and if you show, look at that so mo slow motion, there's little beads of, of molten silver that are going up uh, through the electrodes. And you can make it higher, lower pressure, flow. You just change the current. So it's very controllable. So then you put the, uh, the power on the ignition system, and you get a uh, very, very bright light. You get that idea. So now the uh, that is what we call the ultraviolet and extreme ultraviolet mode. The light is comprised of essentially all high energy light. What you're seeing is a very very small fraction of the light that's actually being produced. So this is a quantitative spectroscopy. We have spectrometers that go all the way from soft X-ray out to far infrared, even down to uh, very very high time resolution, even down to uh, 10 millionths of a second. We can record the spectrum and then quantify how much light there is. So this is looking at, the, this is the actual mission from that, that reaction. Almost all of it is shorter than 300 nanometers. The blue light that your eye can see, the sort of limit of it is around 400 nanometers. So almost all the light is in this high energy region. So to give you an idea, here's the uh, photovoltaic cells. So they'll even go down and get some ultraviolet light, but you can see at 300 nanometers they're non-responsive. They go the uh, lower energy, longer wavelength light. So we transition that light from the ultraviolet, extreme ultraviolet, that we call black body uh, mode or black body light. That's what that looks like. It starts out with the high energy soft x-ray light and then converts over to black body light. So in this system we're going to inject molten silver. These are the capacitors that fire between these electrodes. We're gravity feeding silver between tungsten electrodes. And what we observe is there's a window on this. High energy light, soft x-ray light will not go through typical spectroscopic windows. It's cut off. So the, the shortest wavelength of any window known is magnesium fluoride or sapphire. They can go down to about this region. They can go down to sapphire or magnesium fluoride can go to 150. Sapphire is around 180. So we're using a sapphire window. But we're getting part of that short wavelength spectrum. So the rest of it would be this in this direction. But you can see there's line emission and there's essentially all short wavelength light, it's all short wavelength, and then it's being converted very, very incrementally to this smooth curve, which is they call black body light. That's all frequencies. And what's really remarkable about it is the black body has a cutoff even shorter than 220 uh, nanometers. So it's very, very hot. 
That corresponds to between 5,000 and 6,000 degrees Kelvin. The surface of the sun is the same temperature. So this is this uh, transition. Starts out with the short wavelength light and then converts over to the high energy, or very, very hot. Uh, so it's going from high energy light to very, very hot black body. And it's very high energy as well as a, in terms of the black body temperature. This is a glove box. So this is about the size of a person. This is, this is big. This is not some microscopic cell. The smoke or vapor there is a molten or the silver vaporizing. That takes an enormous amount of power. So we're vaporizing an enormous amount of, of silver in that point, in that case. So you can see it's extraordinarily bright white light that uh, can be converted into electricity using conventional PV. So this is another example of that. That was uh, gravity fed from the top. And we also have, uh, this is the electric magnetic pump injection. Same phenomena. We have line emission, essentially all high energy cut off by the window, high energy light being converted to black body light that has a very, very high uh, black body temperature. And I'll, I'll explain what the temperature means in a second in terms of photovoltaic conversion. So this is being injected from the bottom with the uh, electromagnetic pump. Now, there's no microwave here. There's no high voltage. This is plasma being created at atmospheric pressure that's filling that entire, that entire chamber. That is an enormous amount of power, and there's no, there's no energy source that can be that can, uh, responsible for that. So as I was showing with the blast before we had initial, the initial blast was a millisecond. Yeah, they're running back there now. So we'll just uh, interrupt and let them uh, run the cell. The smoke is the uh, silver vaporizing. They're just running it open so you can see inside of it. It's a firing frequency.
2000. You gonna shut it down? I'll get back. You want to go more? Or you want to? It's up to you. All right, let me give a little more in a moment. Get back to the lecture. Okay, you guys want to turn it down? We want to keep going. All right, we'll get back to lecture. So that's the sun. It's sun in a bottle. <laughs> okay, very good. Thank you, guys. So that was brilliant. Good job. <laughs> All right, so this is the, uh, this is another example. So this, I believe this one's on our web. You can see them in the glove box working, and it starts out UV mode. And then, uh, so this is more or less what we're witnessing live, uh, some of the work we did previously. So it gives me a little chance to explain it. So when you see these energetic particles coming out here, that's, that's really from the power of the reaction. The, the voltage here is extremely small. It's less than one volt. There's no electric field in here at all. There's no microwave in here. And it literally is making the entire volume incredibly powerful plasma. I'll tell you how incredibly plasma powerful. Uh, I'll show you the black body curve. That black body curve corresponds to about 36 million watts per square meter at that temperature. That's a law of physics. You can use something called the Stefan-Boltzmann equation. And if emissivity is 1, it's 36 million watts. Now, emissivity is probably not 1, but even if you take the lowest emissivity imaginable at those temperatures, you're looking at millions of watts per square, me square meter for that, that reaction. So it's extremely, extremely powerful. So you see it's vaporizing an enormous amount of silver. So I'll come back, I'll come back to that, that issue about how we, uh, we uh, run this in a continuous manner for many, many years. So you can see here the electrodes are perfectly intact. They're tungsten and they're very extremely uh, durable. So um, we go back to our engineering design. So you appreciate this. So we had this open, and here actually we have the parts here. There's the uh, there's an outer, what we call a cell chamber, 
there's an inner chamber, which we call the reaction cell chamber, and then there's a dome that is a radiator. So we can insulate this part of the cell so that essentially all the power goes to this top blue dome. And that blue dome can be tungsten and get to, we want to run it at 3,500 degrees Kelvin. Then there's a gap between that top dome and the photovoltaic cells. And the radiation transverses across that gap. So you have the secondary radiator. So we're making black body radiation 5, 6,000 degrees Kelvin in here. That's actually a little bit too high. That's making light into the ultraviolet. So we would lose some of that light. So we're going to make it at 30, plus there's material constraints. So the ideal would be running this around 3,500 degrees Kelvin using materials like carbon or Tungsten, we have a carbon cone in uh, reaction vessel in that, in that uh, chamber. And then uh, having the light secondarily radiate to the PV panels. So it's seeing pure light. It's just like an enormous light bulb. If you look at the filament of an incandescent light bulb, imagine that spread over, say, uh, a fr uh, say two tenths of a square meter radiating the PV panel. The reason why I say two-tenths of a square meter, because if the outside, which we can control, with the outside emissivity is, is one, a 3,500 degree Kelvin black body radiates about 11 million watts per square meter. So it's very easy to get hundreds of thousands, if not millions of watts from a very small area to radiate the PV panels. Now PV panels, the concentrator type, I'll go into some specifics, they're running around a thousand suns in commercial designs, and uh, we have a representative from Massimo here, which we can, when we're doing Q and A, if you have any questions about concentrator PVs, he's very happy to answer that. Uh, uh, and um, the idea, our, our initial design would be around a thousand uh, suns, but they could go higher. For example, two thousand suns and higher. That will bring the cost down and be more commensurate with the type of power that this is capable of uh, delivering to the PV. So this is the black body curve. This is actually, you can go online and look up black body calculator. This is what the profile looks like. It comes down less than 220 nanometers here when it's 5,000 degrees Kelvin. That corresponds, you can see up here, to about 35 million watts per square ma uh, meter. So that's an enormous amount of power you're seeing. And if we convert it to 3,500 degrees Kelvin, we can match this spectrum. So we're adjusting it a little bit. So 3,500 Kelvin, it is quite a good match for this visible region of the photovoltaic uh, PV uh, uh, capability. And that, at uh, 3,500, or this is 3,700 degrees Kelvin, that would have 10 million watts per square meter up here in terms of its uh, radiation. We would run the external dome, uh, that would be running the external dome at a emissivity of one. We'd probably want to run a little bit lower in that because that's more power than PV can uh, handle. They, there's some, uh, some designs in experimental phase that can take that kind of power. That's about 10,000 times the sun's intensity. So 2,000 suns may be doable now, and ultimately when you get into 10,000 suns, the cost of this system could be extraordinarily small. Again, because the cost is driven by the PV, if you make it the same PV produce twice as much electricity, it's half, half, roughly half the cost. So this has a capability of going 
ten times higher concentration than what's being run commercially today. So it's got a potential of being extraordinarily compact, extremely powerful, and very, very inexpensive. And this is a device with no moving parts and can last 20 to 30 years. So these are some commercial products. I know these are some competitors, but uh, just to give you an idea of what's out there, you can see here the efficiency up in the 40s, over 40% at 10,000 times, or excuse me, 1,000 times sun concentration. And then there's uh, the cooling aspect. We're designing the cooling for the cell, the electrodes, and the uh, electromagnetic pump, the induction, inductively coupled heater in the reservoir. So there's that aspect uh, we're managing. Then the radiation goes to the PV panel. That's commercial, uh, commercial parts. That's external to us or fabricated by the, uh, the photovoltaic uh, manufacturer. So there's been questions about how do you handle the heat if you're only converting 30, 40, X percent, whatever it gets to. The rest of it is rejected as heat, but that's something that's already being managed. It's already being produced in commercial installations of tens of mi millions of watts scale for solar. Uh, the, the concentrator PV industry uses very, very large parabolic mirrors to concentrate the light to a size of about a wallet. And uh, it's enormously uh, intense. We create the same light, not with farms, many acres of collector, or many acres of solar panels. We have a very small reaction vessel that incidentally you can put in a car, a train, a plane, practically anything. Uh, and, and it's on site delivering power to the load not occupying many, many acres of land. And it works when the sun goes down. So then the last thing I'll talk about is we're working on another uh, future design of PV. Because we have a high energy uh, spectrum in the soft x-ray, there are materials that are potential, uh, potential um, PV materials for converting the soft x-ray or the high energy light. They're the same type of materials used in the in Blu-ray lasers, and uh, we have a uh, we have a, a very big program going on that as well. And this is showing you one one aspect of how to run that. So right now, with the uh, silver vapor, we have a contained system, and we're doing secondary radiation of the PV off a black body radiator. This is another design uh, that uh, that where we make an adaptation to the cell. These are the electrodes. You can see this way; they're in the along the x-axis, and we have one of these fuel pellets, silver with the water contained in the, sil in the silver pellet, and we're plying a current, and we're getting ignition uh, of that pellet. And you can see the plasma debris, the metal, the molten metal and vaporized metal is uh, being injected in all directions along this axis. So there's initial flash that uh, pretty much goes everywhere. So you can see initial flash, and then you see the, uh, the injection debris along this axis. If we put electromagnetic pump on the electrodes, flash, and then all the debris goes downward. So there's no debris going upward. So we, in this case, we would cool the electrodes, not vaporize the silver, and control the flow of all the plasma downward away from the PV. So we could run that under vacuum and to run direct to the PV with no window and use the high energy light. So we have that program going on as well. You see that? So the plasma is not going up here as it was before. It's all being injected downward. So you get the initial flash, but the uh, plasma uh, fragments go downward. So these are some of the parts, and we have those up here, some of the hardware. And you can see it's, it's a very good um, manifestation of what we have in our, in our drawings. We have, this is what we call a cone reservoir. This is the nozzle for injecting the, uh, the silver into the electrodes. 
So we have the uh, reservoir that holds the silver. We have uh, the plate here. There's an inductively coupled heater that goes around this, and it heats this plate, and then heat's conducted over these, uh, these blocks to heat this um, pump tube of the electromagnetic pump. These are the uh, bus bars for the current that run through the electromagnetic pump, and then the magnets come in on this transverse axis. Showing another view. And that's with the heater wrapped on it. And we put some insulation on there. We heat it up. And that's basically what they're running. They started it up with the electromagnetic pump. And then this coil can then be used to pull water, run water through it and uh, pull heat out to cool it. This is a cooling system of the uh, magnets that are inserted inside the, uh, the magnetic circuit of the electromagnetic pump. Showing more of that assembly. Here's the magnets in place, the magnetic yoke. So as I was going through talking about the magnetic yoke and this being a material like high purity iron or cobalt, there it is. We actually made it. It's exactly what we were showing in our in our drawings. And that's what we're running over there. So this is looking up through the bottom of this uh, lower chamber. And we built all this to run. It looks pretty heavy. We built all this so we could run it under vacuum if we wanted to. We're probably not going to run a vacuum. And this will become very, very thin sheet metal. But just for having the flexibility, this is looking up from the bottom of this chamber. And here's where the magnetic circuits come in. The electromagnetic pump inserts in here. So here are the bus bars that bring the current in, and then they connect up to the, uh, the tabs here on the uh, electromagnetic pump. Here you can see these blocks that transfer heat. So this is looking up in the bottom. Here's the magnetic circuit. These are the external feed-throughs that put electricity through the uh, lower chamber. There's another view of that, the lower chamber. This is showing the uh, feed-throughs for the electrodes and the lower chamber. This is where the magnetic circuit's going in, the cooling. These are two cooling lines. Uh, these are gas inlets and outlets. We have different other options we can add to this. This is showing the, uh, the 3400 farad capacitors, the super capacitors we used to ignite the system. That's what we used uh, to show you the live demonstration. This is the upper chamber. So this would have the cell inside of it. And we have a uh, graphite cell in there now. And then we'd have a tungsten dome that would radiate to the PV. And this is showing uh, an earlier version of a stainless steel cell we had in there. The one we ran today was stainless steel. And, uh, and we're switching that over to uh, high, high refractory materials. So we can run it closed. And, uh, and then radiate the PV. Showing the capacitors, the bus bars for the electrodes. This is that cone on the bottom, the nozzle for injections right in the middle of that. So then we get to our business model. So um, I guess I should say uh, we've talked to some manufacturers, and it looks like we could be in production in 2017. Uh, we probably have some in, in the field testing, uh, generating revenue about around the beginning of 2017 and then be in he heavier production towards the end of 2017. So uh, our, uh, our plan is to take this hardware, make a closed system, do some more optimization. The main, the main uh, f uh, aspects we're focusing on right now is the uh, water fuel injection, the the reaction is very sensitive to that, and the, uh, and the heat uh, management, all the uh, cooling and the, uh, and the materials that go into running this at very, very high temperature. Separately from that, as a uh, contracted out, outsource, is the uh, foldable tank converter, which uh, is application of existing technology, but specifically designed for our particular application in terms of the spectral uh, wavelength range. That is the, the color of the light or the, 
the energy spectrum of the light, and the, uh, the power density that we have. And then um, we will then have a, uh, engineering firms produce commercial, what we call a, an, 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 engineered, an engineered design unit. So that would be something that would go in and be field tested and then ultimately into commercial manufacture. So we're planning on outsourcing the transition from what we're, we're building here. So we'll finish that build out. Then we'll turn it over to uh, engineers that, uh, that we'll outsource to to make it into a commercial product and do the field testing. And uh, we're doing internally now all the uh, what they call interface controlled uh, drawings and all the documentation and all the uh, um, fine details in the engineering that would be necessary to make an engineered and ultimately a commercial uh, unit. Then we're going to have the manufacturing outsourced and we have uh, manufacturers that have uh, offered to do the conversion of our unit into the engineer design unit, the uh, manufacturer, supply chain maintenance, uh, or excuse me, uh, supply chain management, maintenance, repairs, and installs. So our uh, business is going to transition predominantly into uh, leasing equipment to produce power. So the, the equipment can be used in essentially all applications. Um, all in, we have an estimate of what the weight would be. Uh, we took, we've taken these parts and weighed them. And uh, we're probably around 250 pounds before we start cutting weight. And that would be for something that should have um, nominally 200,000 watts electric. So it appears it would be much lighter than an internal combustion engine. can be much more compact. As I was saying, it can get up to uh, 10 million watts per square meter. Internal combustion engine is somewhere around 250 kilowatts, roughly. So it can be very small and very lightweight. And as we cut weight out of it, we'll get better with that. So, um, so this could be used in uh, stationary power. We think it'd be, it could be uh, scaled down to as small as 10 kilowatts. So you could use it for individual homes. You could turn the power up, stack more PV, like there's a way we can use mirrors and vertically arrange uh, photovoltaic to get um, much, much uh, more PV area around the cell to take that extremely high flux or uh, incident radiation. So we could, we could go from 200 kW to the higher scale, potentially with each cell, maybe even the megawatt scale. And then there's also the, uh, the, uh, the certainly uh, the ganging. Is, is guaranteed. You can gang these units and go to higher and higher powers. That is, you just hook more units together, like if you want more power, you hook more batteries together, or you hook more PV together, or you hook more windmills together, or more power plants together. You get more power, you put more units. So uh, it should ca cover the gamut of scale from residential stationary all the way through uh, large aircraft, like 777. Uh, if you gang it, it has the advantage that if any unit goes down, you have redundancy, and there's safety and redundancy. So uh, we're planning on making a scale for automotive around 250 kW. They could be ganged, and you have freight, uh, or you make it a little bit more powerful. You have freight, you can gang them, you have rail. You can use the same uh, 250 kW for light marine. You gang it, you got heavy marine, and so forth and so on. So um, essentially all applications. The other thing that's very interesting is the, uh, the business, as I mentioned, the 60 million units a year in the automotive sector that uh, you have the uh, potential of going motive to stationary. So um, currently buildings now use uh, AC electricity. Um, there are Tesla, for example, runs, a, runs an inverter on their, on their uh, electric vehicle. So you could go directly from the vehicle to a building, or you could go DC, which most uh, hybrids and other um, auto manufacturers use, and go DC and then have an, a, an a, uh, DC to AC inverter. That converts to DC electricity like your batteries have. That's DC electricity. Uh, actually, there's a lot of argument that the world should have gone DC, but it, like a lot of things, didn't go the way it should have 
especially in, in light of what we're doing, but eventually the world will probably go DC. But in the interim, uh, you could put an inverter in a building and run uh, the car uh, input to the building as DC electricity and then convert it to AC in the building and run uh, AC electricity. Same with houses and other stationary applications. So then you would eliminate the grid. So then you would say, well, how fast would it take to impact the electrical grid? As I was saying, 10 days of car production is the equivalent to the capacity, the electrical generating capacity of the entire United States grid. So uh, once you start getting in that market and there's economic incentives, it could go, uh, it's got the propensity of going fairly quickly. And that would uh, so solve a, a lot of uh, infrastructure, maintenance, and uh, build out problems. And it would give you an enormous amount of reliability and redundancy. So then the, uh, as I was saying, uh, what our business will be then is to, uh, to sell power. And we're looking to sell power uh, for a very, very nominal uh, fee. It's very fair and, uh, and, and to be pretty egalitarian and equal uh, across, uh, equitable across all energy markets. Right now there's the automotive market. Um, there's a home home uh, fuel heating market, there's uh, heat pumps, there's, there's electricity in the home. The, there's many, many different energy markets. Uh, gassing up boats, trucks, they pay a different amount than because of the taxes and than automotive, etc. So we're proposing it will be the same. A kilowatt hour to us is a kilowatt hour, uh, independent of whether it's aviation or rail or, uh, or marine or stationary or, or what, what have you. Any application would be the same, and uh, we'd be charging a, a flat rate uh, and owning the equipment and leasing it to the energy user. And then we would uh, cover all the capital costs, uh, the maintenance and repairs, and, uh, and, and the, uh, just providing power for that, that fee. That would be all in cost. So. Um, we're in the process of the outsourcing of the PV, and as I was saying, uh, also um, working on the next generation. So I think there'll be continuous improvements in power density and, and PV, and that'll give the uh, photovoltaic concentrator business a lot of, uh, a lot of incentive to, uh, to push that industry even further. So that being said, um, the, uh, I can take some questions now. Yes? What do you see as the initial target market area? You talked a lot about cars. Is that where you're going to focus initially? Uh, that's a good question. I, I, I would say the target market's going to be um, customer driven since uh, the, the leased unit is pretty, pretty uh, uh, fungible and interchangeable. It'll be with uh, initial partners. So that could be in. Uh, everything from heavy industry to um, to stationary power, residential. It could be anything, and it'll be, I think, market driven. You've got the silver that's going to vapor. Silver's not cheap. Do you have a way to recycle that? And to yeah, that that's not that's uh, the silver. Once you buy the silver, which should be about two hundred fifty dollars a cell, the uh, for a cell that would make some like. A comparable value of about three hundred twenty-five thousand dollars worth of electricity a year. Uh, let me go back to this. So the uh, the cell is uh, self-contained. Probably need to explain that a little further. So the silver is inside here right now. We left it open because obviously you couldn't see inside. And if we let it heat up, I mean, I, I, fortunately it didn't burn a hole in the cell because sometimes it burns a hole through the cell. Um, and it may have, I, it might have, but to get it so it doesn't do that, we have to use refractory materials and have uh, the appropriate design to handle that kind of flux of power. So this was open. And uh, in, a, in, a, in a commercial design, there's this dome and it's closed. Remember I was saying this antenna also serves as a uh, coolant loop. So uh, this antenna pulls heat out of this reservoir and the silver condenses. Silver evaporates at around uh, 2262 degrees centigrade. 
So this would be run cooler than that, and the silver would be, vapor would be inside the cell, but it would condense inside that uh, reservoir. It doesn't go outside the cell ever. So it's inside the cell forever. Is there going to be any tarnishing of the surface so that you uh, reduce the amount of light that it's emitting? It's a black body. So, like a light bulb, once you heat it up, it just emits that spectrum of light. So it doesn't matter if it's silver emitting, or tungsten emitting, the electrodes, everything in there is exactly the same temperature. So there's nothing that has absorbing and diminishing the light. See, one, there's something, this is a, this is a, uh, like the sun. Doesn't matter if it's a flare emitting, well, the flares can get hotter, but the whole surface of the sun is what they call a black body. If you look at the whole thing, it's all the same light in terms of uh, its continuum uh, emission spectrum. So, um, the, um, all right, so this is the, uh, this is what the profile of the light looks like from the plasma inside. And it's 5,000 degrees Kelvin. So this is called, this is called a black body radiator. Black body radiator is a, uh, it's like an entity in physics. It's like a, uh, uh, it has its own, it has a certain inherent properties governed by uh, the nature of what it is. So um, some of the fire burns, like hydrogen, oxygen, you form water. That's, that's the inherent property of, those, of that reaction. This particular entity, a black body, emits light of cur certain characteristic frequencies. So like if you burn uh, one material over another, you're going to get different color flame and different emission from that, from that fire. Black body has the characteristic, no matter what it is, it doesn't matter if it's gas or coal or oil, if you put it inside a cavity and burn all those things and heat that cavity up, it'll emit light like this, where you see no lines. It'll just be all frequencies. And no matter what's making the power, it will have that emission. So it doesn't matter if it's silver emitting, or whether it's the tungsten surface emitting, or the, the surface of the interior of the cell emitting, they're all exactly emitting the same radiation. Yeah, the emitter is emitting that radiation. Inside, so it's all the same. And you've got the surface that's going to be splattered on is a surface. It's on the inside. Yeah. Is that going to cause the amount of radiation going to the panel to be diminished over time? No. No, it's like a, it's like a, uh, a big heat source inside that's heating that top dome. So, it, so it's the dome is what's radiating on the outside. Yeah, I mean, you can prove it to yourself. Let's say you take your frying pan and you stick a piece of metal on your frying pan. You can still cook an egg on that piece of metal. Doesn't matter what it is, the heat's going to go through it. Another question in regard to, you've got this silver moving through the electromagnetic pump, and then you're moving around and you get a transportation and change in orientations. Is that going to affect the functionality in moving system? when you're, you're changing the trajectory and momentum. Well, the only, thing, the only thing it might fix it, and there are ways we can do it with electromagnetic pumps and electro, electrostatic precipitator type designs and things like that. We may have an F-15 and you have it spinning around and whatever, but you can put it on a gimbal and it would just always right itself. But the, the forces involved with injecting that molten metal are much greater than the, than the uh, centrifugal force from like going around a curve. And it's point blank injection. So the, the pump is, uh, is electromagnetic in nature, it's not mechanical, and the, again, the force is big compared to centrifugal. It won't affect it. Yeah, you, can, you can go around with an Indy racer or whatever, it's not going to, or formula like Grand Prix, it's not going to make any difference. Now if you turn it upside down, obviously that's an issue, so we probably have some gimbal that would always stay upright. You can't really do that with a lot of other engines, because you have the gas feeds and stuff like that, it might be an issue, but here, you, here uh, there's so much power in the fuel, you can have it self-contained in the unit itself, or you can pull it from the atmosphere. So there's ways of getting around that, that you could spin and do all the different acrobatics with the engine in a stationary application. I mean, excuse me, in a motive application versus stationary. Okay. Yes. Okay. okay. Hi. Um, I didn't understand if you already tested the full system, including the photovoltaic photovoltaic converter? And if yes, have you ever connected to a grid? 
Uh, we, we have not put the photovoltaic on this yet. We have to design the photovoltaic for this particular configuration. So we have, we have a, a contract for a company to work on that. So the, um, we see ourselves as building the light source and optimizing that. Then we have, then we have engineers that will make it into a product and then into, uh, uh, or excuse me, into an engineered design unit and then into a product. So what we think our job's almost done in terms of getting the unit. So what you saw today, we're going to basically put that into a refractory cell chamber and, uh, and, and optimize the fuel injection and the heat thermal management of that cell. And we're pretty much handing it all over. So as I was saying, we're looking at 2017 in term, terms of what you're asking for, a commercial unit that you could... Now we could keep it quiet and just wait till 2017, but we thought it was important to start getting the, uh, the business community, investment community, uh, and, and the public uh, involved in what we're doing and knowledgeable of our progress and uh, what technology is, uh, is, is, will be basically erupting on, on, the, on society in about another year. Yeah. Sorry if this is too basic. So just to be really clear, so <clears throat> the fuel is injected, ignited, the heat from that heats the tungsten on top, that creates light that is then absorbed by the photovoltaic that makes energy. Yeah, that's perfect. Okay. So previously, in previous iterations, you all were trying to capture the thermal. No, that was, that was uh, light to electricity too. No capture of thermal power, great steam. Nah, we never looked at steam. Nah, we were very early on. I was looking at taking uh, mechanical energy from the, in other words, looking at the uh, energetic expansion of the plasma being charged, and look at magnetohydrodynamic. And then I, magnetohydrodynamic is a viable approach, but you have to have big superconducting magnets, big scale. No, it doesn't really lend itself to uh, to uh, to distributed power on a small scale like this is capable. Take out the cold turbines, put that in there, and then use the current grid, and that doesn't make sense to your model. Didn't make sense. Well, we could have developed that. It's not a commercial, commercially available item, and it would require superconducting magnets, cryo, cryo, uh, uh, cryogen equipment, and stuff like that, which is very expensive. So it'd be, it'd be more like a central gen technology. I was looking more for distributed, fully distributed technology that you could mass produce using commercially available technology. And this seems like the perfect route to go. So I went away from doing, that's a type, uh, uh, a magnetohydrodynamic is a type of pressure volume engine. So this is a pure photon driven conversion process. And just piggybacking, I'm not sure if you're clear on this question. Are you concerned about scaling of the fuel, not scaling and increasing the residue as it condenses inside the chamber, which would then one, eat up the silver, or two, decrease the efficiency of the system? So it's the silver is always recirculated. The only the consumable. The silver. Yeah, the, the silver is 100% recaptured forever. It, we never lose the silver. It doesn't scale on the inside of. No, it's uh, it will not not when it's 3,500 3, degrees Kelvin. Remember, it boils at 2,262. So it's going to be it's going to be vapor, it's just silver vapor, as you saw, and then it'll condense in the bottom. So it's not going to. You can't condense it when you're 3,500 or higher Kelvin wall temperature, and then your your vapor. Uh, boil silver boils at uh, 2262, so it can't can't condense. Now you might have a film on it, atomic film, and I think that'd be good. It'd be protective and increase the emissivity, it bounce the light around in the cavity, and then we can direct it more to the dome by doing some structuring of that. We can change the emissivity of dome, and there's another design we're looking at where we go completely spherical, so it'd be independent of direction. It'd be t completely homogeneous light emission, which will distribute the light very very effectively. So we're probably going to go to that kind of design, then it doesn't matter what's inside. It's just black body power, heating it up, it's higher temperature than the surface black body secondary radiator, so it's constantly going to pour power into it very effectively. And then into the PV. Yeah. Great. Yes. Hey, Ray, uh, three, three questions on the CPVs. Um, so first, um, you mentioned you mentioned that the, uh, you're able to leverage the existing cooling technologies that they've already developed for them, but uh, are you able to use that completely when you've got such high power concentrations in such a small area, or do you have uh, exist uh, uh, further cooling issues you'll have to solve to do it in such a small area? The uh, second question is, um, 
are there multiple sources for C the, the kinds of CPVs that you need, or will you have a bottleneck as one company that only makes the kind you need? And the third question is, uh, uh, I know that when you run high power through the CPVs, uh, it, it, they degrade over time. So do you have a sense of how long these things will last running at high power 24-7 before you need to replace them? OK, first question, uh, the, uh, the cooling is pretty straightforward. And uh, in fact, what we're using is a car radiator, and that'll reject about 100, 150,000 watts. You go to the truck radiator, you can probably get up to around three or 400,000 watts, and it's about 100 bucks. So, um, and they, they last for a long time. So, uh, so that the cooling doesn't seem to be a problem at all, and most of the heat we're going to have, the reject is going to be from the, uh, from the uh, foldable tank. And as I was saying, there's... 10, there's a plurality of 10 megawatt commercial concentrator photovoltaic installations out there operating now, and they use the same thing, some kind of radiator type of technology. So that seems pretty straightforward. Just all you need is a water pump, you got electric fans, and you got the radiator. It's like $100. So, uh, and that, that cost pro probably could be reduced in, in volume, volume purchases. So then, uh, yeah, there are multiple companies. There's, uh, I think it's maybe six, at least, that I know of. And then, uh, in terms of wear on the concentrator, uh, we have uh, Brad Siskovich here. here. Brad can answer your question about concentrator PV. Yeah, Brad's going to answer the concentrator PV question. So for uh, longevity, there's two areas you can point to. Uh, Hello? Yeah, so for longevity, there's two areas you can look at. One is CPV, which is uh, intended to last 30 years, and that has no problem handling that. Of course, it's you know operating 8 to 10 hours a day, so it will be shortened. What that life cycle is yet to be determined. But the other thing to look at is uh, these are the same cells that are also in space, right, which are bombarded uh, much more significantly by higher levels of radiation. So uh, is the number known for uh, Randy's application yet? No. Much of that depends on the concentration we can operate at. Um, so there will be a number. Is it six months? No. Is it 30 years? Maybe not. Uh, but it's somewhere in between. Sure. Yes. Time to get into an auto is, you know, it could be years and years and years. Do you, do you see your first revenue producing units kind of sitting alongside existing, uh, you know, distributed power applications and, and you just really take load from existing existing sources? Like, you know, that, that box is a data center is on a cruise ship, just feeding into the box of a cruise ship or, or you know, or an arc weld at a, at a mini mill or a steel plant. Is that your most logical source of your first revenue producing units? Where well, hey, I'll put it to you this way. If somebody wants to put in a car, we're not going to turn them down. Yeah. <laughs> if somebody wants to put in a truck, we'll say, sure, whatever you want to use it for. Yeah, but those, 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 those you, you, they, can just, they can decide that today, but it'll probably be the 2024 model or the 2017 model. I, who knows? I, ba basically, it looks to me like it's pretty simple. You take our cell, you take out the battery, and you plug in our cell. Infinite range, no pollution, tremendous power. DC electric, everything else stays the same. So I, I think one of the differences is why technology is going to get adopted right away is because number one of infrastructure, you don't need any infrastructure. And then number two, it's economics. The economics are overwhelmingly in favor of doing this. I think there's an extraordinary economic incentive to do it. So I would think if, if somebody doesn't do it, their competitor will do it because they'll just take advantage of the enormous economics and the, and the vast superiority. It should appeal to consumers vastly above any type of mode of transportation there is out there today. Yes? Um, what's the longest that you've run one of the cells at the 2000 uh, per second ignition rate that you've been talking about? And then following up on the question earlier, understanding that you haven't looped the um, ignition system with the photovoltaics, 
What, what kind of problems does that pose and in, in what are the energy balance is going to be like for that? Well, this was runoff capacitors, so the photovoltaic is going to be pretty trivial, taking it from PV and power conditioning it down to just charging capacitors. It's not running directly off the, uh, off the PV. It would be going in just charging capacitor bank. So there's, I don't see any, any real engineering hurdles to that at all. And the, uh, in terms of how long it will run, I can tell you this, we, we run it pr typically like we're running it here because we're boiling off a lot of silver. To close it all up, we would melt the thing down. So we're basically venting all that power out. So we'd, we could run it all day if we keep pouring silver into it and we don't melt it down. So um, I guess the real question is, what, what do we, based on industry experience of the technologies we're using, the electromagnetic pumps have been, which is the only primary part in the whole system. There's, a, there's stationary electrodes with the capacitors supplying them. They're warranted about 10 years. And then the electromagnetic pump, uh, the electromagnet, we built these ourselves, but other uh, companies that build electromagnetic pumps have told us that they have those, those devices in the field, maintenance free for 60 years, and they're still going. So we don't think there's going to be any problem of running this for many, many years. Then you say, well, how about if there's some unexpected failure? It pays for itself in about 10 days. And that includes the PV. So the PV is not going to degrade. At least Brad's going to assure us of that. In 10 days, it's not. And we can replace it. And we still have the silver. So I, I think economically it's going to work out very well. And then you might say, well, what's the maintenance? Well, we're making it so you can screw it apart, and pull parts off of it. The magnets are permanent. The yokes are permanent. No moving parts. Um, there's uh, the EM pump, as I was saying, no moving parts. The cell, the radiator, the PV, no moving parts. So it's, it's really a pretty simple design. Uh, Ignition is just capacitors. Again, no moving parts, no switching. So uh, it, it looks pretty robust. I, I'm, I'm not losing a lot of sleep over it right now. A lot of the other things we're doing with the rollers blowing up and the, all the other things we had, these other ones I, we tried, there's definitely some issues there. This seems pretty straightforward. Hey. Yes? Just update on the patents. What's that? Oh, I'm filing massive patents. Massive. <laughs> so, you can imagine. Another That's question. what matters, what we're commercializing. So they, they can't, there's no actions on them because I just filed them. All kinds of patents. There's a list in the business summary on our webpage, but they're, they're really uh, extensive. They really cover, they're basically a picture claim of what we're doing. So I don't think we're going to have problems getting the patents on it. Yeah, have you already successfully tested the, the closed loop recovery of, of the silver? I mean, it sounds like you're running it open, but have you already yeah. tested the Well, we can concept? condense it, and the materials like graphite it won't stick to, and we can just run it indefinitely. It'll just keep going on and going on and going on. And yeah, it, it doesn't look like it's going to be an issue at all. Yeah. Randy, yes, Sam. With the... Uh, on? Yeah. Um, with the, the, the black body, I, I know a lot of... Uh, people in the room need to understand that concept a little better. And um, as a tungsten or tungsten carbide or whatever you end up using for the dome radiates light, um, if it's operating, the black body is operating at a certain temperature, you're getting primarily a range of light per that temperature. Is that correct? Black body curve according to that temperature. And you can and change the temperature and that'll change the, uh, the uh, mission profile. And so we're getting a specific frequency of light and not necessarily heat. Well, heat would be black body. Could be, heat could be black body, but at longer wavelengths. Correct. So, so what I'm trying to understand like, and have the this crowd... This is visible light. The, yeah, sun, the, the sun is a black body. It's just very hot, so it's all, it looks like all visible light. Right. So, so, the, so what I'm getting at is um, we're, this will be at a, an optimum operating range. Uh, generating a lot of light, visible or convertible light, a minimum of heat? Uh, it, we've, we've had some modeling done. looks like 38% efficiency at 3,500 Kelvin. 
Okay. Because it's with a triple junction. And and so, what do you imagine in terms of um, is there we uh, some kind of uh, inert environment between the panels and the dome? And uh, okay. is the, is the heat just collecting at the at the panel? Like, is there a significant uh, collection of heat at the panel from the dome? It's the same as PV. Okay. PV is getting hit with a lot of heat too. It's only converting maybe. 17% of it out in the field out there. And if you concentrate it, you can get 40% as I showed with some of the devices. So that, that's sunlight. So we're right. making simulated sunlight. So you should just think of it just like sunlight. Yeah, okay. It, it's the same fraction will be heat in both cases. Right, okay. How do you prevent the tungsten from slowly evaporating? Same as they do in a halogen light bulb. Put some material to suppress that. And we would probably have a maintenance item. We'd probably come back and, and uh, do some maintenance on it after a while. It should last a very, very long time. Halogen, you know, they don't blacken because they have iodine. It, keeps, it makes an iodine complex and then thermally decomposes on the tungsten surface and re replaces it. Exactly. So we have that the, outer chamber. What we can the va put, vacuum pump is for? No, the vacuum pump is just to uh, pull the gas, pull the vacuum, and then add what gases we want. Well, we'll put some gas that suppresses uh, tungsten evaporation, or we'll use uh, we'll use uh, carbon. Now, the reason why they use tungsten in a light bulb is because it's conductive. It actually is really good. It's actually a really good conductor. Carbon's not that great. Remember, Edison tried a carbon filament, so we could we could run carbon, uh, or we can run tungsten. And carbon's not a great conductor. But we don't, we don't need a conductor because we're radiating with the heat from the cell. I mean, we're heating, heating it, making it a radiator from the uh, internal heat, not from the electrical uh, resistive heating. And we can coat it with other things, carbide. There's other, there's other ceramics you can use. There's ceramics that go to like 4,000 degrees, like hafnium, tantalum, carbide. Like we can coat it with stuff. and There's all kinds of things we can do that you can't do with a uh, tungsten light bulb. Two quick questions. One, it's the, uh, is it st you're still kind of going for the meter by meter by meter size? It'd be smaller than that because uh, it's, it's too much power. Gotcha. Okay. And, um, but we, we want to go to something like uh, 250kW electric with 2,000 sun of radiation on the PV is kind of what we're shooting for eventually. We'd probably go 1,000 sun the initial generation, then 2,000 after that. So if it's smaller than that, you're, as you said, you're going to have parts that you can unscrew and this and that, but that'll all be easily maintained. The, yeah, all these parts are, this thing's really easy to break down. Uh, secondly, the, um, you know, you have all this on the website, and how difficult would it be for somebody to kind of recreate what you're doing just by kind of looking at all the information you've, you've given them? Uh, there's some advantages of having it in the public domain. There's a disadvantage as well. Uh, we, we thought the, the advantages outweighed the disadvantages. And uh, we're just we're looking to push this to market really quickly and get huge market share, get a lot of people to sign up and uh, get manufacturing capacity, distributor capacity, get, uh, get the uh, end users, customers. And, um, and uh, it help us get, get uh, adopters earlier and other partners. There's no one, to my knowledge, in the field right now. And uh, I think there's quite a bit of skepticism whether you can do that. And we're just going to keep moving and move it into the market. So um, it, it'll take a while for, for competitors. And the other thing is, even if someone wanted to bootleg it, I don't know anybody who's infringing in power technology. And there's a lot of things you can infringe. I don't see anybody selling infringed electric motors or batteries in electric vehicles or controllers. I don't see anybody putting out infringed power generators on the utility grid and things like that. It's a little more difficult to, to bootleg a, a power source than it is, uh, say, a, a hair dryer or something like that. For the next question, we have a, another mic over there. We have questions over there. We'll try to alternate between the two. So, mm -hmm. so if, you want to, if you want to go ahead with your question. Okay. Yeah. That, yeah. Um, one of the key things that hasn't been addressed, I'm sure you've thought about it, we're talking about a continuous power source, you know, one megawatt, 250 kilowatts. Can you turn it up and down? Like when you're going down the road in a truck, you're accelerating, decelerating, coasting. So there's a change in the load. 
do you have the ability with this technology to change the output? Yes. You can change the, the water injection, and you can change the fuel injection, and you can just dump power. I know that kind of, sounds kind of obscene. Most people wouldn't dump power, but it really doesn't cost anything water vapor from the air. And you've got the amortization that capital cost anyhow. So there's no real moving parts. So you just dump it. Just you mean charge for that? What's that? You mean charge for that? Uh, we might have something that, that's load hours. We could, we could build that into the system. But I mean, ultimately, you could, on a microsecond time scale, you could dump the power if you wanted to. Right? I mean, if you really, if you needed to, but there's ways that you can turn, turn it up and down like you do a conventional engine. Like if you take a fuel cell, it takes a very, very long time to respond. This could be very, very fast in comparison. It could grid follow, but if you really wanted it super, super fast, you could just dump the power and just ran it flat out. Okay. And also, you've got a lot of heat that's being produced. Heat is an energy source. Are you going to look at ways of harnessing that, or are you just going to dump it? Probably dump it. It look, it, it, the trade-off is, what's the capital cost to take the heat exchanger? Because you're, you're coming back off the back of the PV. You want the PV to be around 100, 100 degrees C off the cooling side. So are you going to take that heat and use it? Because then you need a heat exchanger, then you've got to go into another heat exchanger, and you have to transport that heat. Or you could just run electric wires. And if the electricity is if it's extraordinarily cheap, you probably just run everything electric, including heat. Hi, uh, Randy, and I'm fine with that. And now, in 2014, you sent a note out on Twitter that said sourcing component issue can't get at Home Depot or Lowe's. I mean, just to be clear, is that that's all been resolved? Yes. Okay, that, that's fine. Thank you. Well, a lot of this stuff that we were making, you can see all the other parts we were making. None of that's commercial parts. So the uh, right now, the the thing we have now is is a, a electromagnetic pump is a proven technology. And capacitors are things we can buy, bus bar, all the stuff we can, we, can, uh, we can buy or fabricate very, very conveniently. It's a very simple design, no moving parts. Uh, so, yeah, thank God. It's, uh, it looks really good. Yeah, Lewis? Uh, have you thought about you know, putting one of these units uh, into a test, test car? Just trying on the streets or running? I'm sure, I'm sure as soon as we have one, we're going to do it. <laughs> you're, you're not, you know, and that, you believe you're going to be in that stage maybe early next year? If everything stays on track and uh, the PV doesn't look like it's that big a problem, and um, so far I, I don't see any showstoppers. But you can guarantee that, so I, I, I'm going to just grab somebody's Tesla and rip it out and put it in there. I mean, we just have to do it. I mean, it's just something you just have to do. Or, or any other electric vehicle, bold or whatever. Randy, um, do you anticipate uh, when you operate this and set the operating temperatures that, that the device will actually kind of work to condition uh, a tungsten dome uh, over time? Yeah, uh, I think it'd be fine. Sh should should st possibly strengthen the tungsten? We yeah. can rib it or make it thicker. We th there's uh, that's a structural issue. Right. There's there's engineering ways of making it so that it has more strength. But we're going to keep the pressure on both sides the same. Right. It's got a way of equilibrating the pressure between the inner and outer chamber. And the outer chamber seals it from the atmosphere. So it's always going to be the same pressure on both sides. But we can strengthen it if we need to. Yes. Maybe one more question. We'll wrap it up. I have no first-hand knowledge of this. But I've heard that there are technologies that resemble this. British groups open in Florida named Santilli. Uh, do you have any knowledge of this? And can you talk about uh, competition, patent issues? Uh, nobody's working on this that I'm aware of. No, no resemblance. No. Okay, thank you very much. Really appreciate it. We're going to probably have, we'll have another one. As soon as we get to our next big hurdle, we'll have another one, and we'd love to have you back. So look forward to that. Thank you.